Order. Order. Uh, the next item of business is a motion to approve stat uh, statutory rule. I ask the clerk to read the motion. That the draft welfare supplementary payment amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2017 be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister for Communities. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I beg to move. Uh, I'm seeking the Assembly's approval for the Welfare Supplementary Payment Amendment uh, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2017. These regulations are uh, being brought in under Article 137 of the Welfare Reform, Northern Ireland Order 2015, and will introduce a number of amendments to existing regulations for the payment of welfare supplementary payments introduced during uh, 2016. The Executive had considered and approved the draft regulations at their September 29, uh, 2016 meeting, and these had been scheduled for scrutiny by the Communities Committee on the 12th of January uh, this year. However, the Committee did not meet on that date. These regulations have been developed following publication of the Welfare Reform Mitigations Working Group proposals uh, on how the Executive should help those who are financially disadvantaged as a consequence of the changes to the welfare system. Uh, and I would like to thank Professor Everson and her colleagues on the working group for bringing forward th these recommendations, which were subsequently endorsed by the executive on the 21st of January last year. Members will recall that last year the following mitigation regulations were approved uh, by the Assembly. These were the Welfare Supplementary Payments uh, Regulations, uh, Northern Ireland 2016, the Welfare uh, supplementary Payment Loss of Disability-Related Premiums Regulations in Northern Ireland 2016, the Welfare Supplementary Payment Loss of Carers Payments Regulations Northern Ireland 2016, and the Welfare Supplementary Payment Loss of Disability Living Allowance Regulations Northern Ireland 2016. These regulations gave my department the powers to make payments to households adversely financially impacted by the benefit cap, those affected by time limiting of contributory employment and support allowance, and those affected by the introduction of personal independence payment. The regulations for debate today are further, amendment, uh, further amendments to the existing welfare supplementary payment regulations and cover various circumstances which could arise and for which provision was not made in the original regulations. Members will be aware that officials were asked by the executive to ensure that the mitigating measures were put in place when the Westminster government reforms uh, were introduced. These regulations give my department powers to cover circumstances not addressed in the original regulations and will not make any substantive change to the administration of the existing scheme. Uh, the amend amendment regulations make the following provisions uh, to require the reporting of a change in certain circumstances, to set the effective date for a change of circumstances, to continue, reduce or cease welfare supplementary payments in certain circumstances, to deal with couples, to disregard sanctions, to allow welfare supplementary payments to be made to a landlord's agent or a person nominated to receive payments on a claimant's behalf, to allow information sharing with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, to set a priority order for the payment of welfare supplementary payments for carers, to align welfare supplementary payments with housing benefit, and to amend the definition of limited capability for work credit, the recovery of overpayments of welfare supplementary payments from future welfare supplementary payments by deductions from benefits, by deduction from earnings, or via the courts. And these regulations will help to ensure the mitigation payments are made under the appropriate legislation and that my department is making regular and accurate mitigation payments to claimants impacted by the changes to the welfare system. I beg to move. Thank you. I call Nicola Mallon. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support um, the regulations, but the Minister will not be surprised that um, I wish to take this opportunity because the regulations make reference to the appeals process, just to emphasise a point that I have been in deep uh, correspondence uh, with his department on. Uh, and that's about the fact that to access a mitigation package, um, the necessary gateway is to go through the tribunal's process and to appeal a benefit decision. Uh, his department has recognised, the Minister's department has recognised uh, that there will be a huge spike. And uh, I obtained figures from his own department which testify to this that uh, the current appeals forecast for this year is just under 12,000. That rises to almost 33,000 next year. Uh, 18, 19, it rises to over 41,000. Um, 
and it goes on. Uh, and the minister did recognise this, and, and he increased the investment in the physical infrastructure of child renewals. But where there remains a gap, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is around advice workers who are specifically trained uh, to assist people through the tribunal process. In Belfast alone, 30,000 people uh, this year alone will go through the appeals process. So, well, I would urge the Minister um, to look again at this issue and, if possible, to bring forward uh, ring fenced funding to ensure that people who have specific training in the tribunal's process are there to help navigate our most vulnerable through what is a very daunting and complex process. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Sir. Um, uh, once again, uh, this is a, the second example in the course of uh, the day that we've had of the potential for devolution to be used in a positive, <coughs> excuse me, in a positive and constructive way uh, to aid those um, in most need. Um, I welcome the fact that the minister has brought these uh, measures forward, and uh, I'm glad to support them. Uh, I would urge all parties uh, to do likewise. Um, it is important, even in the, in the uh, probably the last hour and a half of devolution that we have, that we can use the institutions, that we can use the institutions uh, in this way. And I'm glad that the minister has outlined the detail uh, that he has to the house. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Carl Nicolan. Last can call you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I too welcome this, uh, these regulations being brought forward. And like Nicola Mullen, um, welcome the fact that, particularly in relation to giving independent advice, particularly around benefits entitlement, that would urge the Minister um, to follow suit uh, of Belfast City Council, not just around advice services for North Belfast, but indeed that independent advice uh, service right across and indeed right across the north, uh, because particularly when new regulations are coming in, um, it is really incumbent upon the department to ensure that the circumstances and the change of circumstances, particularly around the way in which benefits are brought in, that there's, a, there's help, help and support. I also would urge the minister and his department to make sure that there's a, also a bigger our greater focus on error rather than just the primary focus being on fraud. I noted that the Minister said this is in keeping with the regulations around PIPs, uh, and yet PIPs was introduced and will be, has been introduced and others, will, uh, other benefits will be introduced without regulation. So it brings it back to the comment he made earlier on about my co pa party colleague, uh, Martina Muller. Martina was right. Those things were brought in without regulation. So, himself and perhaps I wouldn't even go as far as saying the AG, but certainly he's tripping himself over. Maybe he could find 50 grand down the back of his sofa for the advice, or maybe if the advice services were held in Orange Hall, so have a better opportunity of actually getting supported. Um, but the fact is, I want a better focus and a greater focus on entitlement for people who are entitled to benefits. I want to make sure that he and his department have absolutely no difficulty uh, saying this, that there is a better emphasis on error within the department, particularly when new transitional arrangements are being made, and that claimants who are living in poverty aren't, aren't penalised for the, the inefficiencies uh, as these regulations roll out. But I'm, I'm actually glad to see them, because if this actually helps make it clear for people, getting access to benefits are better, but I would urge the Minister to try and give additional support, particularly for the advice sector. Thank you. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Alliance Party is uh, content to support these regulations again, along with the similar caveats which we had to the previous debate in respect of the, the bedroom tax. And it, it certainly is bitterly disappointing that two flawed parties in, in the same government are presenting these regulations to us today. Uh, one, perhaps with the exception of the, of the bedroom tax, more keen to back up their Tory mates at Westminster, and the others just dodging their responsibilities by not going to Westminster at all in respect of welfare reform. Can I concentrate, however, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the uh, situation that um, many advice services and charities will find over the next few months. Not only will they be incredibly burdened by the need to support 
some of the most vulnerable claimants through um, the torturous process of claim and appeal and tribunals. But they themselves, as charities and organisations that support the vulnerable, will wonder where the next penny is coming from, from for them when it comes to the budget for Northern Ireland and the failure uh, of uh, the two government parties uh, to actually provide a budget, which in turn will have the most severe of knock-on effects on those organisations uh, that depend on our budget and arm's length bodies and others uh, to hand out resources to them. I think particularly of organisations um, uh, like Citizens Advice Bureau, like Disability Action and many other voluntary and community organisations across the province who will be struggling and wondering where their resources are going to come from uh, to deal with the, some of the most vulnerable clients when these new regulations take force. But we do support the regulations. Thank you. Uh, I call uh, Claire Bailey, and as this is Claire Bailey's first opportunity to speak as a private member, um, I remind the House that it is a convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption. However, Ms Bailey, if you choose to express views that could provoke an interruption, you are likely to forfeit this protection. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And when I picked this date to, to deliver my maiden speech, I could not have predicted the circumstances under which it would have been done, with the political fiasco that is happening. But um, I have been elected by South Belfast to represent them, and I think South Belfast should be held up as a model for, for the rest of Northern Ireland, because it is the most diverse community that we do have, and I think this is represented in uh, the six seats being held by five separate parties. Maybe the next election will bring a total balance of five and five. Who knows? But, uh, I've long lived, I'm a long time resident of South Belfast as well, and when Lagan College, Northern Ireland's first ever integrated school, opened its doors in South Belfast, I'm very pleased to say that my sister and I were two of the first 28 pupils to attend that school. And my children have been through that school, and it's one of the most oversubscribed schools in Northern Ireland. But it's still a bit disappointing to see that this is not the norm or a widespread opportunity for the majority of children in Northern Ireland. But on the doors over the last campaign, I was trying to invite people to start voting for something rather than voting against something because of a long history of voters in Northern Ireland voting tactically. They tend to vote for something to keep something else out and they end up with something that they didn't want in the first place. So I was really honoured that going out with the message and giving something else as an alternative that I was returned in the fourth seat. But I pledge to the people of South Belfast that I would work hard on equality issues and I work hard for human rights compliant legislation, particularly for women, because women in Northern Ireland suffer from a lack of legislative protections in many areas. We know fine well that we have a lack of women in public life in Northern Ireland and that the numbers are seen to be decreasing since the institutions and the peace process peace process began. My previous job, I worked for an organisation who helped those who have been sexually abused and raped. And their figures show that a quarter of women and children in Northern Ireland should expect to be sexually abused at some stage in their lives. I've worked long and hard with Women's Aid in Northern Ireland. And again, their statistics show that a quarter of our population will suffer some form of domestic abuse, usually in their own home, a place of safety for many at some stage in their life. So when you put the statistics together and start to tell a story, here in Northern Ireland, a woman is more likely to face a pregnancy as a result of rape than ever face her abuser in a court of law. And yet we continue through this house to afford her no reproductive rights or choice when she faces that situation. And the small legal application of reproductive rights and the right to choose a termination, we have Mary Stopes and the Family Planning Association, both situated in South Belfast. We are constantly negotiating through protesters 
who continue a concerted campaign of hate and harassment against people trying to access their services, and yet our laws and legislation seem unable to do much to stop that. Even despite all other jurisdictions across the UK, Scotland, England and Wales, and of course Ireland, making moves and introducing equal marriage, we, or so many, should I say, in this House, are still refusing to acknowledge that LGBT people here in Northern Ireland are still not seen as equals in, eyes, in the eyes of our laws. So I was pleased to be given a place on the Justice Committee. I'm very glad to see that the Minister, the Department and the Committee making strident moves to try and tackle some of this inequality. We were working on stalking legislation. We were working on Northern Ireland's first ever laws and legislation to address domestic violence. I was also working on a private member's bill to try and bring the campaign of intimidation outside reproductive health centres to an end. But these are all wasted opportunities now. But I will stay and I will continue in my promises to the people of Northern Ireland to continue to do all I can for a community that I am very proud to represent. South Belfast also has an image of being a very affluent and leafy suburb. But we need to remember that South Belfast also has some of the most socially and economically deprived wards in Northern Ireland. It has a high percentage of people who are in receipt of state benefits, either through unemployment, disability, caring responsibilities, or simply due to our low-wage economy. We also see through recent published figures that South Belfast claimants are already disproportionately suffering benefit sanctions. So in response to this motion today, I would like to say that perhaps before this executive gives itself powers to roll these, these new welfare reforms out, that it perhaps take a look at itself and put its own house in order, maybe address some of its own financial fiascos before removing some supports to our most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. I call Eamon McCann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, it says here that no one here will be impacted by uh, the benefit cap. This isn't true. Uh, a, fewer people will be uh, impacted than otherwise would have been the case. Nevertheless, that we shouldn't make absolute statements when uh, the facts don't uh, just, uh, justify them. A, a, one of the key facts about all this are, is that when, on the, the child benefit and child tax credit regulations to be lifted as they are from across the water, what it's going to mean is that people who have more than two children are going to be penalised. This is what The Guardian has called the two-child policy and is going to operate here. And remember, Northern Ireland is the area in these islands which has got the highest proportion of families with three or more children. So that particular cut, that particular provision will impact here and impact more here in Northern Ireland than uh, anywhere else. Now, we've also got, if you look at the paragraph 7 or article 7, whatever it is, sort of in this document, under financial implications. Welfare supplementary patients' payments in respect of benefit cap are based upon providing protection for existing claimants for up to four years so that they do not experience financial disadvantage as a result of the benefit cap. The phrase I'm drawing attention to is existing claimants. This very clearly makes this mitigation available to existing claimants. The fact that it doesn't simply say claimants leads me to believe that what we're entering in here, the logic of the wording of this provision, is that our, I, we're going to have a two-tier system depending sort of, on whether you are claiming now before it comes in or whether you start uh, claiming afterwards. That is socially divisive. 
It's illogical, or, and uh, it should be removed sort of, if we had time to do that in the mandate of this Assembly. That's something that we would uh, uh, set out to do. The only other thing I wanted to say is really to underline a point which uh, uh, has been made by Nicola Ballin and, sort of, and, and others here, and it has to do with representation of tribunals sort of, and appeals. Sort of here. Now, I don't know how many members, probably lots of members, have been involved sort of, in this type of representation. Now, going, whether it's industrial tribunals in relation to problems at work or uh, appeals against assessments sort of, by private companies like ATOS of whether you are uh, uh, fit to go to work. Sometimes easy if you're alive at all, if you can breathe. Sort of ATOX will tell you that you're fit to go to work as a coal miner or anything else. So there's a lot of appeals, a lot of appeals there, and a lot of appeals in relation to matters more directly relevant uh, to the issue we're discussing uh, at the moment. Nobody who has been involved sort of that sort of representation or talking to people seeking rep representation, whether through the trade union movement, and I've done loads of representation, more through the trade union movement than through you know, my capacity sort of as, a, as a, a, an MLA. The difference that it makes to people, the difference that it makes having proper representation is absolutely enormous. It makes case after case after case, it makes the difference between winning an appeal and getting some sort of justice and not winning it at all and having to live uh, uh, with the outcome. It's no sense of being. Sorry, you want to come in, Mark? Okay, surely. I, I thank the member very much for giving way. The member has eloquently and accurately pointed out that these mitigations, as welcome as they are, will not render everyone, every household and every family here in Northern Ireland immune to welfare cuts. Would the member agree with me that this was made inevitable by the legislative consent motion passed in this Assembly that handed welfare powers to the Tories? Abs well, it was certainly, I suppose, anybody who passing control sort of, of this area of public policy to the, the Tories, if they didn't regard it as inevitable coming from the Tories, then they'd be very uh, uh, naive about it. Of course that's the case. Of course that's the case. This didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen without the cooperation or connivance of the parties uh, in this House. It does disadvantage new claimants here, and that shouldn't be them. We should stop saying sort of, that uh, these mitigations apply, that nobody is uh, going to be impacted by uh, the benefit cap. Not true. That has not been achieved, and the reason why it has not been achieved is that the issue did not have a sufficiently high political priority in this, uh, in this Assembly. So I am saying this is a bit redundant now to say that this should be revisited and so forth. What I do say is that sort of the levels of social injustice indicated in this two-tier system of, uh, of mitigation, so that reflects sort of the reality of our society over a whole range sort of a policies and a whole range sort of a way sort of, of, uh, 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 of winning a living sort of in, our, in our society. So just as, just as the collapse of the Assembly because of RHI again, reflects something more fundamental than RHI, it reflects people keep talking about the dysfunctional nature of the Sinn Féin DUP government. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's the dysfunctional nature of a system which is based entirely Sort of on trying to reconcile the orange and green politics. It is necessary under our political system that the people identify themselves as either orange or green if they're going to have any real uh, impact. Uh, the Green Party, ourselves, and Alliance Party, of course, when it comes to crucial votes, our votes don't count. People who are registered as other on key votes sort of, are just dismissed. We literally don't count, not taking into account. And we want for dealing with this issue and a whole range of other issues, if we wanted to make a real difference, and if we think there's any possibility of another Assembly mandate becoming a reality, then, Mr. Speaker, I believe sir, that what should happen is that people who are going to define themselves as other, as neither orange or green, should be given the same privileges as the orange and green side. In other words, if uh, a, a, the Alliance Party and the Green Party and people before profit. Let's imagine a scenario in which we returned with 50% of the seats. How would the, how would the uh, uh, Assembly operate? How would petitions of concern operate? Sorry? Could I ask, so order, could I ask the member to return uh, to speak on, on the Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I have strayed as far from the subject as some people have done already today, you know. But, uh, uh, 
Hey, hey, there are people who stood up. But there are people who spoke today, and I don't think they touched on the subject at all. At least I mentioned it before we go on to extrapolate. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, hey, hey, where was I? Uh, uh, I'll mean, just say that's the re the re if you, What's really wrong with our politics in relation to this matter and to others? Sort of is this that the, the agreement and the whole structure of this assembly and the executive it sort of requires people to think in orange and green terms. Because the whole nature of the agreement and the arrangement we have is designed to compartmentalise all of Northern Ireland society into the green camp and into the orange camp and to privilege that. And the whole basis of our politics is to try and get those two tribes and the representatives to work together. What we need is an increase in the non-tribal MLA element sort of in this assembly and elsewhere. And that requires sort of dealing sort of with different prioritising, different issues and different matters. That's what the People for Profit will be doing. We base our politics on what's happening below, sort of what happens on the street, in the factories, and in offices, in schools and in colleges. We'll still be prioritising that. We'll be active, assembly or no assembly. We will be preaching the divine gospel of discontent sort of in uh, Northern, Northern Ireland. And we believe sort of that we will make more advances and will achieve more through the mobilisation of ordinary people to pursue their own interests than we would make whether there is an assembly or not at the end of this week. Thank you. I think that is the, first, the end of the first party election broadcast. Um, <laughs> can I call the Minister for Communities, Mr Paul Gibbon, to conclude and wind up the debate? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, um, I'll deal with some of the issues that have been raised, but just to pick up on, on where we left off, I don't think there's anybody in the unionist community believe for one moment that people before profit is nothing but green through and through. So we can preach all he likes about orange and green. The history of people before profit is very clear. It is green politics to its core. I oh, will. I want to ask the Minister Muller. He's, he, he, uh, he is familiar with the song by Harry Chapin Jr. It's about a little boy who goes into the art class in school. The teacher, I'll just quote this song, that's all I'm going to do, Danny. It's, uh, uh, and the teacher says, Look at, flowers are red, young man. Green leaves are green. There's no need to see colours any other way than the way they always have been seen. But the little boy said, I can see the colours of the rainbow. I can see the colours in the morning sun. I can see colours in the flowers. I see everyone. What the Minister needs to do is to develop some sort of perspective, maybe there's sort of some form of 3D glasses or an adaptation of it, which will enable people in this House to see the world and to see Northern order. Ireland other than a strict orange and green order. terms. Or, or, order. Order. Can I say, I, 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 have been, I have been reasonably tolerant in terms of contributions and allowing members to somewhat stray, given the day that's in it. To stray from the, the, from, from the matters before it. Can I encourage all members, including now the Minister, to address the issue of the regulations? A lovely song from uh, Bernadette Devlin's former election agent. In respect to the regulations, the regulations enable the Department to implement accurate and timely mitigation payments to assessed claimants Im Im impacted by welfare reform. These measures mean that claimants will be given uh, the time to adjust to the impact of welfare reform by providing financial support for up to four years. These measures are unique to Northern Ireland and demonstrate our determination to protect the most vulnerable in our society, putting us ahead of the rest of the United Kingdom in our efforts to do so. And so members have raised a range of issues. I'll do my best to try and address some of them. Let me first of all pick up, uh, Nicola Mallon has raised the point that I know she had entered into correspondence with me in respect of the Belfast citywide. Um, I, I've asked and tasked my officials to explore that issue. Obviously, money was made available for uh, independent uh, advice uh, in respect of uh, the welfare reform, some two million of it. Uh, and obviously, there's been an issue that has arisen uh, around the Belfast citywide, and I've asked my officials to see if that is something that can be looked into. Um, let me move on. In respect to other issues that members raised, um, Claire Bailey made her maiden speech um, eight months into the, the job, and she outlined, I think, what for some realise, realise what is on the ballot paper in respect of this issue. And 
I want to be very clear, Mr. Deputy Speaker, dealing specifically with the points uh, that Claire Bailey has raised. Um, whenever we talk about abortion, I will always protect life. I will always act to defend life. When we talk about marriage, I am very clear. I will always stand with the definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman. That does not make me anti anybody, but it puts me fair square behind where I believe our values should be as a society. And I'll not change my position. And so when Sinn Féin talk about LGBT rights as one of the reasons for what they're doing, there will be no compromise on my part when it comes to dealing with the issues of abortion and marriage. I will always protect life. In respect to, no, I'm not going to give way. In respect to the other point that she raised to do with um, those who are sexually abused, I agree with that. That is something that is appalling for people to happen. I met with Savia only last week in terms of the report that is due to be released. And the pain that came through their voices at what is happening with Sinn Féin walking away from this executive was palpable. Palpable. And that, again, is something that Sinn Féin need to be held to account for. When they put party over people, and that's what's happening. In respect, Mr Deputy Speaker, of the points raised by Carol McCullum, her attack on me is just a continuation of the attempt to assassinate my character, led by Gerry Adams, taken on by Marcino Mueller, and some of the outrageous comments that he w said on the radio about me as an individual. I will stand with my record for the public to decide upon. I will not be pigeonholed by those sitting opposite me as to how I conduct myself and the people that I represent. But from Carol McCullum, who stripped money out of musical instruments, let's remember that, stopped the scheme. Stopped the scheme. Did we collapse the institutions? No, we didn't. From Carol McCullum, who jumped on officials in her department when it came to safety concerns at Casement Park. Officials who came forward wanting to ensure there wasn't a repetition of the Hillsborough disaster at Casement. And what was Sinn Féin's response by Carol McCullen to jump on those officials? So I'm not going to take lectures from Sinn Féin when it comes to these issues, particularly around sectarianism. Again, what did Carol McCullen do? When Sandy Rowe came forward and those other clubs about sectarianism and bigotry within the Irish Boxing Association, denied it. And this is a party who now has the temerity to accuse others about respect, equality, sectarianism. I don't think so. I refer the members to what happened to Mordecai and the plot that, name, that Haman went about building the gallows in order to get Mordecai. We know the Republican plot. You're building the gallows. History has shown what happened in that story. We're prepared. We'll go to the country. Order. <clears throat> I have to say I didn't expect Mordecai to, to, to feature, but anyway. Um, the, uh, the question is that the motion standing on the order of paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.